All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a pretty sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Matthew Kleiman, who is in Boston on the other side of the country. How are you doing, Matthew? Hey, John. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Yeah, and Matthew is the co-founder and CEO of Cumulus uh, Data Digital System, an accomplished entrepreneur, executive, investor, and author, making a profound impact in industrial maintenance and construction, co-founded Shell's TechWorks Innovation Division in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Re revolution revolutionizing, easy for me to say, the energy supply through a systems thinking approach. And his latest book, Work Done Right, addresses the global issue of poor work quality in industrial facilities. And that's what we're going to talk about today is uh, work quality and implementing systems thinking. So, um, Matthew, maybe bottom line this for people like what do you mean by systems thinking because i don't think everybody you know or people probably have different definitions of it sure john uh thanks for that introduction and so by systems thinking we mean looking at uh whatever uh your facility or project whatever it is you're working on in the industrial world looking at it as an interconnected system and what that means is uh think of it like almost like a human body uh, mm -hmm. You have uh, the body as a whole is your system. So you could think about that as your, your, your factory or your manufacturing site is the human body. Uh, and then you have the cardio, uh, cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, the nervous system. Each of those are both uh, self-contained, but also interconnected. If you are not bringing in enough oxygen, then you also have issues uh, with brain function, for example. Mm -hmm. And in industry, uh, poor work quality is often because of breakdowns between these various systems. And historically, industry uh, looks at their facilities uh, or our facilities, sorry, uh, in a very uh, siloed way. You know, I have my job, I have my mm -hmm. production line, I have my construction site, my part of the construction site, what I'm responsible for, and I am just going to go do this work uh, and 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 make sure it's done properly. But I don't, I'm not going to think about how one piece of the facility is completely interconnected with everything else that we're doing, not only the physical facility, but supply chains and mm -hmm. worker skill and quality and everything else. That's what we mean by thinking about things systematically um, as from a system engineering perspective. And then, uh, you know, how much how much did uh, did COVID and supply chain and, and all the impact on manufacturing, how much did that kind of bring into sharp focus maybe the the gaps in in systems and the the lack of interconnectivity between the different parts of of of, a, of an organization that's a great question and it was a major driver of of bringing this into focus because uh, you kind of flipped everything on its head in terms of having to suddenly think about how do people walk around these facilities how do what can i digitalize what can i have people uh, do work from home versus what kind of work can come from home. People had to completely rethink their businesses. You know, how do I get uh, materials from point A to point B to point C? Uh, and, 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 and how do I deal with supply chain disruptions? And that really brought a lot of attention to uh, rethinking how businesses work. And that's where systems thinking can be really helpful. Uh, and, it, and it's kind of interesting, isn't it, when you think about, uh, you know, some areas like this and you think of manufacturing or whatever and you think back and you think back to you know the japanese model and uh you know uh, lean and six sigma and all of that mm -hmm. and how everything was around you know efficiency and, and constant efficiency yeah. but now a lot of that is because of digital transformation a lot of that is kind of in isolation and it needs to spread out to the other parts of the organization yeah, lean, uh, lean, and Six Sigma, and those other uh, uh, other types of philosophies did a lot of great things for manufacturing, but it also contributed to this siloization because you you break everything down to its component parts and you optimize each component part. Uh, systems thinking, uh, which really comes from the which comes from the aerospace industry. So my background was originally in aerospace, mm -hmm. and this was developed uh, this concept was developed shortly after World War II or really during World War II as aircraft and then eventually spacecraft became much more complex. 
um, you, you it, it evolved to how do we make aircraft safer? Um, and you know, it used to be that that aircraft accidents were were unfortunately quite common. Uh, it was fairly dangerous to go on a cross country flight. Whereas today, it you don't even think about it. You hop in with your family at the airport, and I could go from Boston to San Diego, and with you know, the, the chances of anything going wrong during that flight are so infinitesimal, you don't think about it. Well, that's because of systems thinking and the aerospace industry developed that over decades. And the reason I wrote the book, Work Done Right, uh, is because I've spent the last 10 or 15 years of my career trying to bring those concepts from the aerospace world into critical industries like construction and manufacturing, because I think there's so many lessons that can be learned to make these facilities safer, to prevent worker injuries, uh, and to prevent quality issues that it's already been solved in the aerospace world, but now we can bring it over to these other industries as well. And then uh, from the aerospace world, how much was digital transformation at the at the heart of that? And how, how, have the, how has that industry been kind of leading the way on that? Because I think that's something that a uh, a lot of uh, companies and industries are struggling with. They know this idea, yeah, digital transformation and interlinking yep. everything, but they don't really know how to bring it, how to do it in practice. It, it goes hand in hand. And the reason is, is because with digitalization of, of your work processes, your paperwork, your procedures, the data you're getting from your equipment, that all can, if, if done properly, can feed into your view of your system. Just like mm -hmm. uh, going back to the human body example, the more data we can get about our sleep patterns or cardio rhythms or, or whatever, else, or what we're eating or our digestive system, all that data can, can come in and inform decisions when you can process that data systematically. Uh, when, you're, when you're processing it in a silo, um, you, you could really miss. Uh, you could really miss a lot. I, I, I write a story in the book about a relative who had a problem with his eye, and it turned out uh, that they couldn't figure out why was he losing vision in his eye. And it turned out there was a problem in his colon that mm. was causing the release of chemicals that was damaging his eye. Well, that was almost discovered by happenstance, but that's an example of how one completely disconnected system. Um, affects another and the, all the eye specialists who were trying to help him just were, weren't thinking about it. They weren't thinking about the, the colon and how something wrong there could lead to blind uh, to blindness. But once they figured that, that out, oh, now we can stop this problem and we can stop the vision loss. Yeah, it, I mean, that's a great example because I think the uh, the medical and healthcare industry is a great example of of silo and how everything is kept separate and Absolutely. you know even mind body you, know, you go to a, a psychiatrist for your head you go to a doctor from your body and never the twain shall speak. Exactly. <laughs> so I think that's a great I, I think that's a really good example. And I think the other part too is it obviously obviously system thinking has to come from the top as well. So it requires those in leadership in the organization to start taking a, a broader view. And that's often often where the silo thinking begins, isn't it? Because you just have people man you know looking after their own parts, but taking a a, a a a systems view across the whole organization and learning how to collaborate, that's got to be one of the biggest challenges. It absolutely is because once somebody reaches a senior level in the organization, they start to, to, to be able to see uh, across the organization and many times for the first time. Uh, and, and a lot of really great companies, they have programs that, that bring uh, high potential executives through different parts of the organization to give them different tastes mm -hmm. of what the organization does. So they recognize this need for a cross-functional view of the organization, but that doesn't get translated into problem solving. Uh, it's okay, we want these executives to understand how each, each part of the organization works, but we're not going to systematize uh, looking at these interconnects when we're thinking about business strategy or, uh, or, or planning or, or financial reviews or IT systems, whatever it is we're trying to do, that type of cross-functional view has to be just part of the DNA uh, and it's a lot more than just having people rotate through different mm -hmm. departments. It's let's get let, let's through digital transformation, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, make sure we're looking at data from each part of the organization and understanding the interconnects between how our HR practices and our supply chain practices and and work quality. All of this goes together 
and has to be thought about holistically. Yeah, no, it's it, it's fascinating, and and uh, you just mentioned data there, and I think that's one of the the critical things. Is obviously you need you know good data, but you also need to really focus in on what data is important because we've gone through a period of you know it was like oh data and big data, more data, everything, more, more, more instead of like getting down to, okay, it's fantastic that I can access a lot of different data. Number one, is it good data to begin with? Right. And second off, is it useful and actionable data? Yep. Yeah, and that's actually an area where the new technology around artificial intelligence, specifically large language models is really exciting because you're absolutely right. Through a lot of the big data revolution, when I used to work for Shell, we would see we would get companies that would come to us and say, you know, effectively give us all your data and we're going to create all kinds of value for you, whatever that value might be. And our response was often, well, the data is either non-existent or it's broken. It's in people's heads. It's on spreadsheets. It's in binders. It just isn't in usable form. And what uh, and therefore you could do a nice pilot in something that's very contained, but to deploy something throughout an enterprise uh, became almost impossible. Uh, and, and then the big data started to get a little bit of a bad name because of that. Mm -hmm. But what these large language models allow you to do is take in a whole bunch of imperfect data. And, and because the large language model begins to, to, have, to, to have inference and prediction in, in looking at data, not just looking at data literally, it could really help you understand patterns that exist even when the data is broken and imperfect. And we're just starting to see the earliest uh, applications of that in industry. But I think that's one of the most exciting um, aspects of artificial intelligence isn't so much the chatbots, which are cool. And, and I'm sure there's useful applications for chatbots like ChatGPT, but using these technologies and integrating them with your imperfect data and using that to glean really novel insights uh, is, is gonna be transform uh, completely transformative to industry. Yeah, no, I agree. And the fact that you can use natural language and stuff, it's going to make it so much easier. Yeah. Um, the, the other part, uh, the other part, I think, Matthew, is uh, integration has become easier and easier now to have all your systems, you know, speak to each other. But people, again, but people still struggle with that integration piece. Like, what should I integrate? What should be the core? What should be the core systems? What other systems need to feed in? And although it's becoming easier to do, it seems to be harder for people to figure out where to start or what systems they should be integrating. Right. What, what's supposed to be your source of truth? And, and yeah. every company wants to be the platform company that's a source of truth. Mm -hmm. Very few companies uh, say that they're, they're happy to be the integrated component of a right. much larger system, uh, at least from the marketing and, and sales perspective. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're you're absolutely right, and I wish I wish I had a, a a clean and crisp answer for that. But that is one of the biggest challenges we have is so many different systems. Some talk to each other, some don't. Everybody wants to be that source of truth. How do you uh, how do you how do you organize this? And, and then you have the big players like an SAP and mm -hmm. and others who they're in a position to be the source of truth, but they're so generalized across so many industries that when you go to a specific facility, a specific construction site, and then they come and say, well, you have to pay X millions of dollars to develop the custom implementation of our system, that becomes a huge barrier into itself. So the more we as a technology industry can do to make things interoperable, to make people understand, to make it clear where data resides and where that source of truth is, it's gonna make systems thinking a whole lot easier and it's a journey. It's better now than it was five or ten years ago, but it is still far from perfect. And I think that's a I think that's a great point you make there, though, about the fact that it's it's a journey because I, I think we're always looking like for this idea of we come up with something, we deploy it, implement it, and then we move on, uh, as opposed to going, no, it's a journey and things adapt and evolve over time, and perhaps we have to modify. We need new inputs. Or, or whatever, but obviously systems thinking is something that you have, to, it has to be ongoing. You can't just have somebody, I mean, bring somebody in and say, here, I'll do all the systems thinking for you. And then you leave and it's back it, to normal. It has to be 
part of your DNA as an organization, as I mentioned before, mm -hmm. it, there has to be people, uh, you'll have the specialists who are trained uh, to think this way, but uh, we wrote the book and the book is, is, a, is a pretty intentionally a pretty short book because we didn't want this to be an academic to, tome that, that only the experts read. It's, mm -hmm. it's really designed for everybody in the organization at all levels to be able to read and appreciate and see how it applies to their work, whatever it is. Um, so that everybody can start thinking this way and and kind of looking up beyond uh, whatever hole they're in and, and look at how the rest of the the field looks and the rest of the company looks uh, is is incredibly important. Yeah. So I mean, without naming companies, can you give just a few kind of examples of some of the work you've done with companies and what impact it has had? Sure. Um, well, one uh, I'll give a couple of examples. So one is looking at um, uh, looking at uh, this is this is public at this point but after the Deepwater Horizon disaster there were a number of energy companies who came to uh, companies like where I was working in aerospace this is before mm -hmm. I joined Shell to understand how do you prevent something like the Deepwater Horizon uh, from happening again this is back in 2010 for people who may not mm -hmm. remember is the BP oil the oil spill uh, and it killed, you know, I think 11 workers and was an environmental disaster. Um, and and what we did is uh, coming from the aerospace, the, the, the energy companies came to us and said, we want to learn from the aerospace world how to make facilities safe, how to build fault tolerant systems. And so we looked very closely at all elements of these offshore operations from uh, training of the workers to how these uh, each individual components of the systems worked, and were able to make some pretty radical changes in in how these facilities were designed and operated, in order to make them uh, safe and to hopefully prevent a Deepwater Horizon style disaster from happening again. Uh, just this, and the second example I'll give you is uh, something we did uh, within within Shell, and again, this has been published and, and presented at conferences. So, you know, not giving away any state secrets here, but uh, we were looking at uh, leaking pipes. 20% uh, mm -hmm. of leaks at a refinery or chemical plant come from improperly assembling bolted connections. So think about uh, how you would use a torque wrench to uh, tighten the tires, uh, your, your wheels yeah. onto your car. Same thing you do with piping connections at a refiner at a processing facility. Uh, you have to tighten those bolts properly. And if you under or over tighten them, that's how you get leaks. Well, the way that the industry typically addresses these problems is uh, multiple layers of human inspections, right. from inspectors. And no matter how many inspectors we throw at the problem, uh, we still get a lot of leaks at these facilities. And so we were able to use systems thinking to look at the whole supply chain of uh, where information and quality assurance happens in piping assembly. And what we found is that uh, there was a lot of digitalization and planning these work activities. There was digitalization and collecting records after the fact, but it turns out everything that happened in the middle, once you had a plan, then it would go to workers in the field. And that was all done on paper. And a lot of the mm. mistakes were that digital to analog paper, back to digital data transformation that ended up uh, resulting in, in, in mistakes and errors and miscommunications uh, because you were transforming this data a few different times from digital to paper back to digital. And by digitalizing that whole process in the field, we were able to reduce leaks at the, at the refineries uh, to almost zero because suddenly that chain wasn't broken anymore. Uh, those are those are fantastic examples, and um, you know, especially the last one there. I mean, that's a, that's a big big reduction, but it is a great il illustration of the problem that faces a lot of organizations because they may think they're pretty sophisticated in some areas. You said maybe they've digitized a lot of things, but then you have these analog or manual processes in the middle, and yep. therefore what come you know, therefore you have lots of opportunities for for problems. Exactly. And it's and what systems thinking lets you do is identify those gaps that you 
may not otherwise find. And, you know, in the example with the leaking pipes, mm -hmm. there were plenty of people that said, oh, we digitalized all of our, all of our piping maintenance and construction activities. Well, no, you didn't. You just didn't realize it because you didn't look to, you didn't, you didn't look at it holistically. And that's what systems thinking brings to the table. Yeah, yeah. And I think at times it's probably, you know, when people are thinking that their systems thinking, there's a lot of that kind of manual stuff down there. They're just glossing over because that's oh, just, oh, that's, that's not, that's too not hard. important. Yeah, yeah, it's oh, not it's, it's too not important enough, or it's just right. too hard. The, the worker who acts to actually go and turn the wrench to tighten the bolts, yeah, they're just going to do what they're just going to be trained, and we're going to trust that they were properly trained to do yeah. that work. Absolutely. Well, Matthew, this has been fascinating, and all of Matthew's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your book. Sure. Uh, so I am uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Cumulus Digital Systems uh, that came out of a, a, a system study that we did when I was working in the energy business. And uh, you could find us on LinkedIn. We're very active. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out. My email is matt at cumulusds.com. As John mentioned, they'll put it at the bottom of the screen. But mm -hmm. happy to talk about you know th this topic with anyone. I really love. It's a passion of mine. It has been for. 15 years now and please go to Amazon and, and check out the book. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, it'll all be linked below, but thanks again, Matthew. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.